I've come here, but I don't have slides. It's just me, I'm afraid. But I'm not going to talk for long. I'm just going to give, hopefully, what will be um, a few talking points to open up a bigger discussion. Um, I've been a freelance journalist and editor in the transition from, in my case, print to digital. Um, and the transition came while I was at a, a, a correspondent based in Jerusalem. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, what the best of those changes has been. Um, and the first thing I would say is that uh, digital has taken away um, a hierarchy which I think has been a fake hierarchy in terms of expertise. So um, whereas before there'd be certain people who'd be allowed to or have access to um, be considered as experts, now uh, if you're a journalist, if you're creating content and you're looking for experts, um, the possibilities are so much wider and greater um, because you can ask social media for help. Um, whether that's uh, by looking at uh, you know, Google Scholar for academics in the field, or whether you're looking at Facebook groups, so where you know, people with pockets of expertise congregate, or you could just ask Twitter, um, you're going to find experts very, very quickly, and that is only going to improve uh, your journalism, I think. Um, one of the things that has is partly a result of that, but it's also partly a different way of thinking about journalism within digital journalism, is that your content is, is really, it's, it's not the end, it's the start. Um, the content that you create is the start of a conversation, um, it's the opening gambit in an exchange that you hope will happen uh, between uh, the person who's created the content, or the organization where it sits, and it's audience. Um, the way that people are consuming news now is much more about being part of a community that discusses news. Um, there's much less interest in just reading a story and stopping there. Um, so you really want to um, encourage that dialogue and see it as, as a part of, of, your, of your journalism, a continuation of your journalism. Um, in terms of on the ground reporting, obviously uh, you have instant access much faster than um, non-social media in terms of having people on the ground instantly able to see things. Um, I write a lot about the Middle East, so obviously in terms of the Arab uprisings that was crucial. Obviously verification is a massive thing, um, and I think that news organizations are perhaps less willing than they once were to hide behind we can't verify caveats anymore. Um, it's become much more, look, if you can't verify it, then don't use it. Um, and you know, taking responsibility for that, and there's all sorts of guidelines um, about how to verify uh, content. Um, the other thing uh, that you can do with social media, if you're, this is particularly true if you're writing comment and analysis, is that you can see what bits of a story are interesting. Now, I'm not saying social media should dictate what you create, but you can quite often see um, which bits are more durable, which angles people are getting more interested in. It's not always what you think it's going to be. Um, so, for instance, I write quite a lot about diversity and race. Um, that you will remember the case with um, Rachel Dolezal, who's an American um, white um, civil rights activist passing as black um, and claiming to be culturally black, instantly opened up a very large conversation about identity and race and at what point uh, you can claim ownership of race. But what happened on social media was that because it was the timing was very close to um, the sort of coming out, if you like, of uh, Caitlyn Jenner, um, who had, by that stage, gone through a transition of gender, um, and she was given a lot of media attention. And that instantly on social media brought up the conversation of, well, hang on a minute, at, at what stage do you get to claim to be a woman? If does it have the same 
relationship as race? Do you have to have lived in your race and also lived in your gender to claim it? I don't think that would have happened without social media. I don't think those connections would have been made, certainly not as quickly, and I don't think the conversation would have been as expansive and as rich as it ended up being um, if it wasn't for um, digital journalists interacting and listening to what, what that conversation was uh, online um, because it was very different from what it was in a sort of straight reported way. Um, for comment pieces, again, uh, social media is really useful for seeing what the counter arguments are. It becomes much easier to formulate your uh, position, your analysis, if you become aware of what uh, people's concerns, what people's objections, what people's preferences are in relation to a certain subject. Um, we all know this, we all bounce ideas off each other in a very organic way and you know things like social media with Twitter, that's basically happening in real time for you. Um, just a couple of points in terms of being on the other side of uh, actually commissioning content as, as opposed to creating it. Um, I was in the Al Jazeera newsroom last year. Uh, I worked with a very, um, very advanced uh, interactive team who were doing amazing things that are about 20%, 20 points, 20 years ahead of what we actually had the capacity to do. So, you know, constantly trying to get them to slow down so we could catch up with them. Uh, but one of the things that became instantly apparent there and being in planning meetings is that not everything needs to use all the amazing tips and tricks and developments that, that you guys are engaged with. Not everything needs that to be great journalism. So there was a tendency in planning meetings to say, that could be an interactive, that could be an interactive. Actually, it's probably better off as a 350 word reported piece. So we don't always need the bells and whistles, that's one thing. And just to, to close off, I would say that um, the content has to be good. So people might be really impressed by interactives or immersives, they might look beautiful, um, they might have lots of amazing tools and gadgets that you can get involved with, but that's not going to sustain unless the actual quality of the journalism is good. So uh, the sort of uh, news reportage interactives I worked on, they wouldn't have worked if it wasn't really high quality, beautiful writing and really high quality uh, cinematic uh, video and photography. So. That, that's the key, I would say, to doing that kind of work. The technology is amazing, but in the end, the product is only as good as the quality of the journalism. Thanks. <laughs>